to small communities. Amidst this climate, efforts to reform outdated immigration policies have stalled at the federal level as the country has become polarized and paralyzed by competing perspectives on the benefits and liabilities of immigrant workers to the U.S. economy and culture. As chair of the Chicano Studies Department, I have had unique opportunities and responsibility to be a resource of information and a facilitator of people's understanding of this emerging population. And I say emerging, which I will talk to you about that. In my alliances and friendships with new immigrants and engagement with the broader public, concerned about the impact of immigration on, this, on the state's well-being, I've gained new insights and appreciation for the complexities and harsh realities that influence immigrants' decisions to leave home and risk life in El Norte. I also have witnessed firsthand the impact of what it's like to be considered a problem, an unwelcome presence, even though workers and industries that depend on immigrant labor thrive in a mutually beneficial relationship. Further, despite the pervasive media portrayal of the strong anti-immigrant movement and the intensification of rhetoric by politicians, I've seen how immigrant families often forge very strong intercultural community relationships at work and in their personal lives. In the fall of 2006, as I began conceptualizing a project on immigration and the short and long-term impact of the emergence of Latinos as the nation's largest ethnic minority, I asked myself, what can possibly shed new light on the immigration question and the changing demography of the US? Issues that are both uniting the Latino community and making us individual and collective targets of bigots, nativists, and everyday folks who think of all of us as outsiders without regard to facts about when, how, or why we came to be here. What information and whose voices are missing from the increasingly hostile debates about immigration and national identity that surround us? How can we interrupt the incessant media hype and sensation that pits us versus them? These questions loomed large as I thought of how it might help reframe the immigration discussion, the immigration discussion. I reached the conclusion that the best way to really explore this problem was to travel across the country and see firsthand the impact of new, uh, new immigrations, to speak firsthand with folks within and outside of the Latino community about what their presence in any given location has meant, and to listen and learn lessons from their experience as a means of broadening and deepening our perspective. As I planned my approach, I could not ignore the role the media and its pundits played in shaping public perceptions of Latinos in the national imaginary. As an avid consumer of media, I often feel inundated by the negative coverage of Latinos in crime, our portrayal as illegals, as interlopers, as a cultural and economic threat to be regulated and micromanaged by laws writ large and small. All of these concerns strike many Latinos as absurd when one considers that our existence in the Americas predates the existence of the US, either as indigenous people or settlers, even as we also share status with most Americans as multi-generational immigrants. For better or worse, we embody the history of the Americas, including the US, which continues to sort of arrogantly proclaim itself as America as a bold act of effacement of its intercontinental neighbors. The complex, conquest, commingling, and contradictions that comprise uh, this identity form the core of Latinos' historical experience as transnational migrants. What is lost on so many people is that the upsurge in immigration across the southern border throughout the entire 20th century is a direct result of US policies that have actively recruited immigrant workers into the labor force and intervened repeatedly in the economic and political self-determination of Latin American countries, policies and practices that continue to this day. In other words, we're here because you, or the US was there. In other words, Latinoization is not a phenomenon that occurs with the United States as a passive actor. Rather, it's a consequence of the interconnectedness of imperialism and globalization, processes in which the US plays a central role and is a primary beneficiary. Immigration policy, then, is at the nexus of the domestic and foreign policy. From Ju July 1st uh, to through December 19, 2007, I traveled approximately 8,500 miles through 34 states around the perimeter of the United States on a bicycle to explore our America. While my means of travel was non-traditional for a scholarly research, my decision to travel this way ensured that I could go off the beaten path and meet people in small towns I would not have met if I traveled by other means. It had this and many other benefits, including the acquisition of new insights in, on the complexity of the social landscape and a renewed respect for the natural environment that immigrants traverse and toil within. My trip was characterized by hundreds of chance meetings and introductions by friends via phone or email to immigrant rights advocates in various regions in the country. I conducted more than 75 formal interviews and held countless formal conversations with people. This year I have two books coming out with UT Press uh, based on this project. The remainder of my talk today will focus on the insights gleaned from the interviews that comprise conversations across our America. 
Many of the interviews in this collection exemplify what Victor Zuniga and Ruben Hernandez Leon uh, highlight in their important anthology, New Destinations, Mexican Immigration in the United States, which focuses on the novel geography of diverse receiving contexts, where each context has its own racial hierarchy, history of inter-ethnic relations, and ways of incorporating immigrant workers and their families. These stories from the front lines of the immigration debate complicate and often contradict the vitriolic discourse of anti-immigrant pundits, politicians, and voices that inundate new media forms. So what I want to do now is uh, give some background before I start talking about my trip in particular. And one of the first things I want to remind everybody is, and we often forget about this, is historically that immigration is the source of tension in this country. It has been for, for more than 100 years. And uh, the earlier presentation that I mentioned uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act has always also been racialized. And there's also, always been a debate about who belongs, who doesn't belong, what is the cultural and linguistic characteristics of Americans, even though we also at the same time love to proclaim ourselves an immigrant nation. I think we have these, con these contradictions. And so these uh, short little uh, uh, caricatures and uh, historical documents show is that there is, has been, even amongst Eastern Europeans, debates about who belongs. Do the Irish belong? Do the uh, Italians belong? Do the Germans belong? There, there have long been uh, English-only efforts uh, way before they were talking about Spanish, but actually many people had fears that Germany was going to be the dominant language. So Ben Franklin, uh, other people here in the history within Minnesota are striving to pass uh, English-only laws uh, for fear that Germany would take over as the dominant language. So again, when it comes to talking about uh, Latinos, I guess I'd like to, as I stressed already a little bit, is keep in mind the history of the Latin American U.S. relationships, which are, uh, what are the root causes for sustained immigration throughout the 20th century, the push-pull factors of our own domestic policies, our foreign policy as it relates to Latin America, and then the ongoing impact of the uh, immigration of Latinos to the U.S. I won't go into great detail here, but just remind you that if you look at the uh, history of immigration, the history of colonialism in, in the U.S., it would, you, you would begin to see some patterns here. And if I just jump to the early part of the 20th century, it's important to understand that, uh, again, the Mexican Revolution was a pivotal uh, moment for almost a million people of Mexican descent to come to the United States because they were fleeing uh, a civil war. On the other hand, it's important to understand that went hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution here where people were actively recruited. This is where we first see people coming up to the upper Midwest to work in the railroad industry, the agriculture industry, uh, the communications industry, and the, so that the development of the U.S. as a superpower in the Industrial Revolution was, you know, foreign workers were key to that. And, but then you also had these sort of contradictions that we continue to see today, these cycles in which immigration and our economic situation go hand in hand. So that when we had the Great Depression, you all of a sudden had a desire to get rid of these folks who had helped build the country, and you had deportations. You saw the same thing in the aftermath of, oh, there was a great economic boom in the aftermath of World War II, or there was the need to have uh, develop the Bracero program is to get mainly uh, migrant farm workers, but also railroad workers uh, in the middle of World War II because there was a shortage of male labor in this country, so they called and actively recruited uh, and developed a program to bring in Mexican uh, temporary workers. And then that program lasted, instead of just being a few years of the war, through 1964, because we were going through an economic boom and we wanted those folks here as a source of cheap labor. But even in the midst of that, you had another deportation era. So again, there is this cycle, and, and it's not, uh, it should surprise no one that in our current economic crisis, there's also an intensification of the rhetoric against immigrants. Uh, again, I just want to point this out, though, because it, so what happens so often is that people think that Latinos are all new, we're all new immigrants, that have somehow has arrived in the last 20 or so years. Now, much of this, to some extent, not entirely at all, uh, it may be true in places that have not had large populations of Latinos, such as some parts of the Midwest, some parts of the Northeast, but even this is changing. So there's this common view of Latinos as immigrants who've only recently come, but it's important to understand that Mexicans had a strong presence here since the end of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848. Puerto Ricans were incorporated officially into the country as citizens in 1920s in the Jones Act. Why is that important? Because many people don't think of Puerto Ricans, I mean, uh, wrongfully think of Puerto Ricans as immigrants, and they're not. They're internal migrants because they are members of this country as a commonwealth of the nation. Cuban Dominicans became, uh, started, came in larger numbers in the 1950s and 60s due to our relationship with these countries during times of their uh, social uh, upheaval, so they came as refugees, and certainly Central Americans in the 70s and 80s, because and why do we grant refugee status? Because we have to bear responsibility for, the, for being in uh, Central America and supporting oppressive regimes there 
that caused the conditions to make people flee, and for their for their uh, both for their very lives, for their human rights, and for their economic uh, well-being. And then you start seeing a larger influx of South Americans in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, again, this will give you just, I'm going to go over these pretty quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about them, but they're basic 2010 census data. Look, you can see the large number of the growth, the rapid growth of Latinos only in the United States from 1980, sitting at about 14 and a half million, to 2010, sitting at 50 and a half million. That is a rapid increase, by no doubt. Uh, you can see the percent. In 1980, Latinos were 6.4% of the population. In 2010, they're 163 so this is a significant increase. Uh, this will give you some sense of the overall percent change. And you see, uh, again, in the, in the Northeast, sort of uh, the 100% of the population change in the Northeast was due to Latino growth. In the Midwest, 60% of all uh, de uh, demographic change as a result of Latinos uh, coming in. But they were, 50 they were about 50% of the newcomers. Uh, again, you can look at the rest of it and you see major change. So that 55% of the population change in the U.S. from 2000 to 2010 as a result of Latinos. In the Midwest, Latinos sort of had the largest proportion of Latinos throughout the country, about about 7%. Uh, again, some major, uh, some what, some highlights. Three and a half times the increase between 1980 and 2010. Uh, more than about 44% of persons added to the U.S. population in those 30 years were Latino, and they were designated the largest minority group in 2003. So we are, this country is changing. There's important reasons for this. Some of this is immigration, but it's not all immigration. Uh, again, we're going to be living in a different world, and it's important to understand this. Nearly one in five Americans will be an immigrant in 2050, compared with one in eight in 2005. By 2025, the immigrant, a share of the population will surpass the peak during the last great wave of immigration a century ago. Uh, the Latinos will triple in size in terms of the proportion of the population, and they'll make up 29% of the population in 2050, compared to 14% in 2005. Uh, and by 2050, this will be a majority minority country, and many people have actually pushed that date slightly forward. Uh, but here's partly the reason that's not about simply immigration. It's to tell, I mean, just compare sort of the uh, white and Latinos, and look at the birth and uh, death rate. You know, there's about 21 million births of Latinos in that, uh, in that census period, with compared to 18 million deaths. For Latinos, are approximately 9 million births, you know, about only about 1 million deaths. So it's kind of a 8 to 9 to 1 ratio here of birth and death. That accounts for significant change. Uh, so, this, you know, it has major implications for widening the, of the gap the growth uh, rates between Latinos and whites in the near future. This image here gives you a sense for where most of this change is occurring in the country. And this time around, it was a very different picture for the 2000 census. The 2010 census shows us what? That most of that change is happening in the South. And so what does this mean? It has major implications for the culture and uh, racial understanding of people in the South, which used to have a very binary sort of black-white framework for understanding uh, group relations. Now, of course, uh, South Dakota is one of these areas that also has significant uh, experience major change. Uh, again, uh, this will just give you some sense of what's happening here in Minnesota. In 1980, there were approximately 32,000 Latinos. Now it's about 250,000. Uh, this will give you just another portion of growth. And you see, again, same rapid growth experience in Minnesota as well. Uh, this is, this, I always found this picture very insightful as I looked at this number here. Look at the diversity, and again, I wonder about the anxiety in places like Minnesota that are fairly homogenous. Uh, there's always been some diversity here, and I know that the Latino population goes back into the beginning of the 20th century. Of course, we have a strong native population, but not necessarily uh, a steady presence, but not necessarily large numbers compared. But if you look at the diversity of Minnesota in 1960, you're talking about approximately 2%. I mean, it's not a, it's a pretty homogenous, culturally and racially homogenous state. Uh, and so now, in 2009, it's up about 17% of about 800,000 people. Uh, this will give you a sense of the, the population by racial and ethnic group over, over a few year period. Uh, again, I want to talk a little bit about the, the labor trends because this is important too, is that the labor force comprised of native born workers is shrinking, the demand for services and resources is expanding, and employers are looking for workers at both ends of the spectrum, meaning you need low wage workers, even as many people 
have decided uh, generationally, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about this, that they want and need a, a, a higher education to be more socially and economically mobile. And that's understandable. Uh, especially in rural parts of the country, uh, it's very important to understand what's driving that. And again, what are the trends? Well, you, here's what I often refer to as many people, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the anti-immigrant discourse simply says, you know, absolutely, you know, Amnesty, let's send everybody back home, let's deport everybody. And, uh, but I think for one thing, I think many people don't realize our country's dependence on this work because a lot of this work is what we might call invisible labor. People work uh, primarily, the, the niches are construction, restaurant, food, vegetable preserving, you know, food management, landscaping, travel accommodation. A lot of behind the scenes work that we often, I think, take for granted. Uh, again, in Minnesota particularly, you can get a sense that, of how that corresponds, which is very closely to this, this need for the number of new jobs and uh, over time it will be needed in these areas. And a lot of them are the same kind of work. It's often low wage work. Uh, again, despite all this, it's important to also understand that with a uh, new uh, emerging group also comes emerging economic power. And this will give you some sense of the size of it that's expected to grow by 50% from 2010 to 2015. Uh, it will equal more than 10% of the U.S. total buying power. Uh, again, one out of seven, right now, approximately one out of seven Americans are Latinos. There's still a geographic concentration. And what do I mean by that? Well, historically, you had Mexicans in the southwest, uh, Cubans in the, in the southeast in the Florida area, Puerto Ricans in the, uh, uh, the northeast in the New York area, and maybe some mixture of Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in the in Chicago area. Uh, so to some extent, that's still true, but it's also changing because now there's much more dispersal throughout the country. Uh, the Latin community does have a high number of uh, recently arrived immigrants, and it's also true that with this uh, recently arrived immigrant, you know, they do tend to come here because they have not been able, they've been struggling to survive in their own home community, and so they do uh, lower the overall average income of the Latino community with the education level. But what's important to understand is that Latinos do integrate both culturally, and by all measures, they seek education, they understand that uh, English is the language of success, despite the fact that many people fear that uh, Spanish language will dominate. Uh, new immigrants know that in order to succeed in this country, you need to speak English. And what has happened is that many of the support services that used to be in place for helping people make the transition to English no longer exist. Uh, so there's a growing, also Latino middle class. It's important to keep in mind. Now, I mentioned, just talked about language, but uh, the other measure is, again, if marriage is any sign of people getting along, there's a, if Latinos have the second highest rate, other than Asian Pacific Islanders, of intercultural marriage, because there's a, there is a high rate of that. Uh, there's also a lot of entrepreneurship, and again, I point to places like, I don't know about, I don't know St. Cloud that well, but in, in Minneapolis, for instance, we can point to two or three places that were once uh, sort of experienced economic decline, geographic places that are now booming because of Latino entrepreneurs coming over and starting new businesses. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit and shift now and talk about um, my first book that's coming out this May, that the other book, but the first book is really a, a collection of interviews, and I train them and organize them, and this is sort of the organizing principle I use to identify certain themes. You know, I wasn't able to include everybody, I had to be selective. And these are the ones I saw that were people were really talking about. Uh, you know, the whole thing about, you know, about how home is no longer home, how they had to change, this emerging sense of mutuality, which I think is very, very important. Uh, nevertheless, ongoing threats to the community, the need to assert uh, civil uh, and human rights, you know, internal migrations, that is people who are just moving one side of the country to the other, not coming from outside of the country. And, uh, and then just life along the border because that has changed very drastically along with the immigration debate. Uh, and again, when I spoke to people, I'm not a social scientist. I was really, I'm, I'm a literary critic. And so I'm interested in people's stories. How do they represent themselves? How do they understand? How do they narrate their own lives? And so I, I didn't go about doing surveys. What I did was actually say, you know, everybody comes from somewhere else. And where did you come from? Uh, you know, how did your families get here? How long have y'all been here? I didn't assume everybody's a new immigrant. And I was not only talking to immigrants or only to Latinos. I talked to people across different communities to find out how they're experiencing this change, which I felt needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, so how, is, how are things different than they were in the past? Is it, you know, is there any legitimate fears for this fear of a, a clash of cultures? You know, what have been the benefits and challenges to local communities? And to new to immigrants, I would ask, you know, do you have regrets? Have there been benefits to this? Has it actually worked out for you? 
And I want to share some of the observations that I had uh, to, just as a way of giving, again, bring the human side of this because one of the things that I've noticed over the years is, is uh, I think Steve mentioned even, is that many immigrant communities will say, you know, we just want you to know who we are to humanize us because all this, uh, again, rhetoric oftentimes dehumanizes people. And to call somebody an illegal alien is really to make them some kind of out otherworldly being that you don't have to consider as anybody equivalent to you. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, these themes. And one of, the, one of the observations I made is that this notion of culture adaptation and exchange is ongoing and not unidirectional because people talk about this fear of change. I was in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Slept there overnight, went to some all-American all diner early one morning, and uh, okay, I'm gonna have to move along here very quick. Uh, and I, I stopped at this uh, little cafe, had breakfast, saw that they had this insert of a Mexican uh, menu for breakfast, and I asked the waiter after I ate, I said, so is, does that mean there's change? He said, oh yeah, if you go that way, you'll find out. I'm riding along, I see this uh, mural of the Virgen de Guadalupe, which is a, a very important icon in the, really the Americas, you know, the Latino America. And so I went inside and talked to them and find out that the owner is not Latino, in fact, at all, but is, he's white. And what I learned the story of is that in his relationship with the local Latino community, he has not had very difficult life, and he learned from them uh, that this is a sort of a patron saint that you could appeal to to help you, to help support you and help you grow. And he did this as a way, a testimony to what they did for him. Uh, again, I'll move along to a second observation: is that it's important of understanding uh, people from you know why people left their homeland and what how they came to be here and, and what their life has been about. This is a particular uh, uh, excerpt from a uh, conversation I had with, with a woman who heads up an uh, immigrant rights organization in Eugene, Oregon as well. And she told me about coming in the 1950s as part of the Rossetto program. Mm -hmm. uh, but she also tells me a story of when she uh, was in her early 20s. She married an Anglo-American. They moved up to Eugene, Oregon. And she was asked to go uh, do a translation at an event held by the Quaker community there. And it turned out to be a Central American solidarity uh, a meeting that was talking about trying to stop the U.S. from intervening in Central America. And so through this act of translation, her life really transformed and she became somebody who was very interested in looking at U.S. foreign policy and she became a very strong human rights activist. Uh, again, I'm not going to play this particular video, but this is a, uh, uh, what I learned from this young man is the importance of his own father. His father came here and received amnesty during uh, 1986 because he'd been here many years working and how uh, what that allowed him to do was to go on the market and find better wages. And because before he sort of had to stay put where there was a large sort of population so he could sort of be in the shadows and hide. But once he sort of received status, he was able to go seek a better way somewhere. And that can help me understand the geographic, the new geography of Latino immigration to some extent. Uh, okay, again, I'm gonna talk, get to talk some about uh, Minnesota locally here. But this is something over and over that I found is that there's a lot more going on locally and uh, there was a sense that, there, you know, yes, things are changing, and yes, they're hard, and yes, there's some contradictions, and yes, there's some anxiety. But there is this recognition that, uh, of dependency. And for instance, I'll talk in a second about Melrose, Minnesota. I mean, in Minnesota, I spoke with people in Worthington, and sort of uh, uh, Melrose, Albany, uh, Cold Springs, Long Prairie you know, community, uh, down in uh, Rochester, certainly in the Minneapolis area. And I learned even just locally things that I would also learn across the country. And that is that much of the work that's being done, if you think about it, in the agriculture industry, in the dairy industries, in the meat packing industry, you know, it's done by immigrant workers. And, it's, and here's why I understand it, because a lot of times the rhetoric says, this is happening because they're taking our jobs. Here's the reality, and from the ground level of what I heard from people, is that, for instance, in Melrose, the story was, People no longer wanted to do the very noble work, no, and there's no doubt about this, all kinds of work has dignity as long as it's honest work, right? Uh, but people, that's very hard work, and it has limits in terms of your social mobility. You're gonna make nine, 10, 11 dollars an hour, something like that. But people are moving to uh, St. Cloud, or, or, or commuting, saying, I wanna to go to school, I want a better job, I want a more white collar job, I don't wanna do this difficult work and not be socially mobile, and have access to be able to buy new goods and things. So they were no longer making, they were opting out of doing the generational work that their parents had done and turning places like Melrose into what we call bedroom communities. They might still live there, but they drive them into, into St. Cloud or something. And so you had this paradox going on where new they, businesses 
and politicians make a choice that we're gonna, in order to keep our economy alive, we can't have uh, Jenny O leading count. We can't have you know uh, somebody else uh, deciding to leave because our town will just die. And so they begin to actively recruit people to come and work. And so you have this paradox of a new generation of immigrants, in a way, sustaining the lifestyle of a, a retired workforce that would work in that same industry. And that was a very important recognition for me. Uh, again. I, just, I met this one couple, Peg, John Peggy Stockton, and John Stockton was the top players last year. But they talked, they moved specifically from Nebraska to Minnesota and when they retired because they wanted to be mediators to help make transition, uh, help move against transition because they had done work in Latin America when they were younger. Now, their own children were not necessarily supportive of their, their pro immigrant uh, stance, but they talked about this. It's like, well, we know from having spent a lot of time with these folks that they're good people at heart, that they work hard, that they're, uh, you know, they have, they're strong, in their case, you know, Catholic. I mean, there's so many things. It's like, well, you know, if our children are being comfortable with it, that's just too bad. We're gonna, because this is something very important to us. These people were well respected in Melrose as uh, people who started the English Language Center, who began to help found an organization that put, uh, let new immigrants and older residents talk together. Uh, again, spoke with the police chief there. He told me, too, about, uh, Again, basically the one who told me the story about uh, Jenny O needing new workers. He also said, you know, yes, there's cultural misunderstandings, there's confusion, there's anxiety, especially sometimes with the older folks who don't know how to understand, for instance, different cultural ways. You know, an example he gives me here is, you know, oh, they're you know, killing a pig in the backyard and you're gonna, you know, cook it. And he's like, well, how's that any different, you know, during hunting season when we we have deers in our backyard and we, you know, gut it and skin it and cook it, you know, as well. And so as part of he says, you know, we just have to play the role. And that was for me a very important lesson is, uh, this is sort of a continuation of that one, but about the role leadership plays. What are you talking about? Police, teachers, politicians, lawyers, you know, people with power in communities make a difference on whether the community is going to be open-minded and sort of say, we're going to mediate change in a positive and smooth way, or we're going to clamp down and buckle down and sort of see it as us versus them and fight this. And over and over in other parts of the country, for instance, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Carpentersville, Illinois, so many other places, uh, you see this debates going on where, uh, you know, what is our stance going to be? For instance, I think it's Lionel Lakes here in Minnesota recently, last year, passed an English-only law, which I thought was fascinating because they never even had a single request for any translation, but they felt like they wanted to jump on the bandwagon of preparing in case anybody asked for a translation. Uh, again, uh, these places like Carpentersville, Illinois, Hastings, Pennsylvania became sort of the birthplaces for these local anti immigrant ordinances against uh, housing, against rental housing, against education, <coughs> against jobs. And what happened is that, well, they are having uh, court battles and many of these have been struck down. The other reality is, is that both of these com uh, communities have experienced major economic downturn because those immigrant ordinances, anti immigrant ordinances worked and people left. And then uh, you, you, know, you find the papers, I was following this stuff in the papers all the time where people in Hazel are saying, well, yes, it worked, we did a great job, but now we have to figure out how to take it back, how to change the law back and let, ask them to come back because we're suffering uh, so, so bad economically as a result of having had success. Uh, again, other communities you know, display their support uh, for the immigrant heritage in different ways. Uh, again, in the larger cities, I'm gonna try and move through this very quickly and so we can get to some questions, but in the larger cities, uh, it's maybe about, not about immigration, it's about gentrification. It's about the need to figure out how to maintain cultural cohesion in the midst of gentrification and other threats to the Latino community. Along the border, Latino communities are really being challenged by the building of the border wall and, and the kind of uh, anti-Latino discourse that has raised, the kind of increase in, uh, in immigration enforcement, which is really in, in intensified, and again, this, uh, lawyer for a prop for an immigrant rights project down in the South, in Texas, South Texas border told me about how, yes, y'all have raids up in the factories up there, but here, you know, they're going house to house. Can you imagine the phone calls we get in the middle of the night when they're banging on somebody's door? He goes, it's all because, you know, in his mind, yes, they're trying to enforce what they perceive as a law, but they're trying to do it through intimidation and they're doing it in illegal ways and we're just telling people to let them in when they don't have to let them in and all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. There's contradictions. On one hand, all this anti-Latino rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric, has racialized Latinos more strongly than ever. But on the other, so in some ways, that's created uh, a more unified Latino community. But 
there's a still a stronger sense that we're just sort of perpetual outsiders who constantly have to prove ourselves and why we belong here. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave you with this quote from this guy, but I'm not gonna play his quote. He, he does talk about the ambivalence, but this is a gentleman who runs a, uh, a basically a Rossetto program in El Paso, right along the border. His office is right across the street from Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Everybody knows that 100% of the people that use this center were, you know, uh, except for the few U.S. Uh, citizen workers there, is undocumented. But they leave them alone because they never bother us because they know that we feed the local economy. It's the workers who come here from across the border to pick the chilies, to pick the corn, to pick the crops, and they never bother us. They might pass us somebody away from the center, but here is the safe house, not because we have to defend it or declare it or call it a sanctuary, because the politicians, the business owners, you know, would, uh, would raise hell if they actually tried to enforce it at this center because this is this absolute dependency on this labor. Now he told me something else, and a lot of immigrants, and there's a lesson I learned along the way too, is that a lot of immigrant rights organizations, especially, well really everywhere, they have to do work uh, to make sure that, uh, that immigrant communities have access to law enforcement so they're not totally exploited or taken advantage of. And some of that work is specifically around domestic violence because women are, more, are very vulnerable. They cannot go to the police if they're experiencing domestic violence. So they do a lot of domestic violence education work and they work with the police departments to say, you know, they need to be able to call you and know that they can call you so that they're not going to get turned into ICE if they call you for help and they're experiencing abuse. And Carlos Valentes told me this, he said, he said, you know, that, uh, that there's an analogy between made between domestic violence and immigration policy. Because in my opinion, you know, uh, our immigration policy is like a case of domestic violence. Because again, you have to know, keep in mind, that in a domestic violence situation, um, uh, you know, usually it's a man. A man does not beat a woman because he wants her to leave. He beats her because he wants her to stay. He wants her to stay under his conditions. He wants her to stay under his control. He wants to manipulate and exploit her and have her live in fear. Because if that's what we do, in our immigration policy is that we're not really wanting to get rid of people because if we can't afford to actually get rid of them, we're trying to control, manipulate, and exploit them to the max. And that runs so, so true to me that I found a very haunting way to think of it. Uh, okay, I see that I'm running out of time and I want to go ahead and uh, just open it up and see if you have any comments or questions. And obviously, it will touch upon every area. These will just be some pictures going on in the background. 